Turn now to John chapter 14. As we continue on through the book of John. We'll be reading verses 1 through 14. This is God's word. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than, he, than these will he, will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, we do pray that you would impress uh, these words upon our hearts as we consider Christ and all his dimensions as our Savior, as our elder brother who has gone before us, who sits at your right hand. We pray all this in his name. Amen. Many of you in here have said goodbye to somebody for the last time. It might have been a family member or a friend uh, that you knew was going to die soon. Uh, it might have been unexpected, something you did not uh, uh, know was going to happen. Uh, sometimes, especially when you move to another state, uh, you say goodbye to people and uh, there's no uh, impending thing that's going to come between you, but uh, you just won't, in God's providence, see them again. Uh, however it happens, though, goodbyes are really, really hard. And so often it is difficult to know what to say in those moments because your relationship is crossing a threshold. You're moving from a place of having them in your life to not having them in your life. Your life is different when you are separated. It might be better, but it may be worse. Either way, it's different. Life changes for you. One of the difficult things about saying goodbye to someone, particularly for the last time, when you know it's the last time, is that you cannot speak to them again. There's nothing more to be said to them. Uh, there is no more exchange of thoughts or ideas or even pleasantries. It's just goodbye. And there's many goodbyes in the Bible. And we have the words of these goodbyes in many places in Scripture. We have Isaac. Uh, blessing his two sons, uh, each with a blessing intended uh, for the other son. Uh, he thinks he's blessing one when he's really blessing the other. We have Jacob, uh, one by one, blessing each of his sons and giving them a prophecy that would define them and their descendants. We have Joseph uh, reminding his brothers that the promise of God to bring them out of the land of Egypt would come to pass. Moses gave a, a very lengthy speech uh, that we read a little part of earlier, uh, containing both a recounting of God's faithfulness and also a warning to anyone who would forget that, that faithfulness and turn their back on their God. In the New Testament, we have Paul, who has his own. Uh, he gathers the elders from Ephesus, and he warns them to be on alert against the wolves that would seek to devour the church and tells them to maintain the example that he had set for them as a faithful minister in Christ's church. 
And these chapters that we are in right now are called the farewell discourses of Jesus. In these words, we have Jesus' last words to his disciples. But of course, this goodbye that he is giving them now is different from all the others. The feature that all other goodbyes have in common is that they are permanent. Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Paul, they're all going to die and they're all saying goodbye forever. But Jesus, however, has a unique task in his goodbye. He's going to die, but of course he's not going to die forever. But even then he's going to live again, and then he's, but he's still going to leave. He's going to ascend to heaven and go to a place where they could not immediately follow. Understandably, this causes a great deal of confusion among the disciples, and they have lots of questions. But in these last words of Jesus, which really, as we find, aren't last words at all, uh, we find comfort. And not just comfort, but we find our principle of unity. We find our hope. We find our mission. We even find the secret to the Christian life. And of course, we know also that in Christ, no goodbye is ever final. Now, as I said last week, uh, we see these first words of the chapter immediately following those devastating words that Jesus said to Peter, that you're going to deny me three times. But these words are also an introduction to everything else that he says uh, all the way through to chapter 17. Don't let your hearts be troubled. This kind of, uh, the kind of goodbye you know, that's most frightening and disturbing is one uh, that comes when someone uh, you depend on is going away. And these disciples have depended on Jesus. In fact, their whole lives have, been, have changed as a result of Jesus. They've left their jobs. They have left behind families. They've left behind any sort of safety and comfort they might have had in this life in order to follow him. They've pinned everything, all their hopes on this one man. And now if he goes away, what are they going to do? How are they going to live? What's left for them here? And to this, Jesus offers his first words of comfort that even though he is going away, his purpose in going away is to prepare a place for them. In my father's house are many rooms. Now, I grew up with the King James Version, which I think says uh, are many mansions, which sounds a lot more exciting than uh, rooms. But the purpose here is not to tell us what sort of lodging we're going to have in the Father's house, but to say that there is room for these people. In other words, they're going to have a personal bodily existence in the Father's house, and they're going to live in the Father's house because Jesus is going to prepare a place for them. And we might imagine from this language, and I think I always uh, I thought, thought this when I was a kid, and I think I still it sort of intuitively comes to me now, is that I think of Jesus going into heaven and, and uh, uh, getting some heavenly timber together and some sanctified nails, and he's, he's up there hammering away, building uh, uh, my particular room uh, or mansion even. Uh, but uh, the preparation that he's talking about is really quite uh, different than that. The room's already there, but permission to live in that room has not yet been granted. If you want to live with God, you have to have permission. You need him to let you in. And Jesus, in a few hours from these words, is going to get permission for all his followers to live with him forever. He's going to open up heaven for them when he goes to the cross as a sacrifice and takes away their sins once and for all. And when he ascends to heaven and rules his people as the fully human God on the throne. His will be the first human body to exist in the heavenly world. And his presence makes it possible for all his people to live with him. Because he has the right to be there. He gives us the right to be there. But this, of course, introduces another question. How do we get there? This is something the disciples were wondering. Jesus tells them both that they know the way to where he is going and that he will come and get them. But Thomas seems to ignore all this. And he says, well, how will we know the way? You can almost feel the anxiety amongst the disciples as they 
uh, repeatedly sort of ignore other things that he says that explains, uh, gives them the answer to their question. They're, 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 they're terrified right now. They're, they're scared. They're, Jesus is leaving. How are we going to get to where he is? And so Thomas asks, how will we know the way? And it reminds me of when Jesus was talking to Martha at the tomb of Lazarus. We read about back in chapter 11. He asked her if her brother will rise again. And she says, yes, I believe that he will. He'll, he'll rise on the last day. But Jesus wants to point her to something uh, bigger than just the fact of a distant resurrection that seems to happen automatically, but to himself as the one who, is, uh, who causes the dead to live. And so he tells her, I am the resurrection and the life. This is one of those I am statements that we find in John's gospel Places where Jesus is not just saying that he is something, but that he is Yahweh, the one true God, who is the source of that thing. He is not just the one who makes resurrection happen. He is actually the source of resurrection. And so he turns to Thomas and sees that Thomas doesn't yet understand who Jesus is and that all of their salvation from beginning to end is found in him. Jesus doesn't just make salvation possible. He doesn't just set out the terms for their salvation. He isn't going to show them the way to be saved. He is the way to be saved. He himself is the truth that saves. He himself is the life that they will be given. He is not pointing out the way to be saved. He is the way and the truth and the life. He is the door to heaven. He is the path to get there. He is the one who makes the dead to rise so that they can live with. And so in that last phrase, he gives one last I am statement. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And this is one of those passages, of course, that points out in uh, bold terms that the only way to God is Jesus. There are not many paths to God. There is only one, and that is Jesus. It's not a road that you travel. It's not rituals that you follow. It's not teachings you listen to that gets you to God. It is a person you believe. The statement of Jesus here is said to be the core statement of the whole gospel. I am the way, the truth, and the life. In fact, it's what he's been pointing them to all along. Apart from their works, apart from their good intentions, apart from their outward displays of righteousness, Jesus is the way. The only way to be saved. And this is, of course, a hard truth for many to believe. What about all the good people in the world? What about all the people who do such good things? Uh, don't they have a spot? Don't they have a shot in heaven? But the Bible says that there is no one who is truly good but God. What about all the people who've never heard about Jesus? Well, that's why Jesus tells us to go and make disciples of all the nations. Christianity is not a religion that's supposed to be a secret. It's good news. It's meant to be published. How could a good God send people to hell? Well, why do you think God is good unless you got that idea from the Bible? Why do you believe the Bible on that point? But not on the point of what it says about what God requires. Jesus is the only way. That's hard news, but it's also good news. There is a way. There is salvation. And you don't have to work for it. You don't have to climb your way to God. God has come down to us so that we may go to where he is. And it's this point uh, in Jesus' discourse here that, that causes another round of questioning. And these, these questions come from uh, Jesus needing to uh, uh, explain that the reason you know God the Father, that is the reason that God will allow you to live with him, is because you know God the Son. He says, if you know me, you know the Father. To know the Son is to know the Father. And the ESV sort of makes it sound like the disciples don't know him, but I think it's better translated, uh, if you know me, you know the Father. This, too, is a hard concept for them. Knowing the Father is not something they are accustomed to thinking about. Jesus, remember, is new to them. 
right? They might have been looking for a Messiah, but they likely weren't looking for that Messiah to be God in the flesh. The Father is someone mysterious. He was always mysterious to the people. He lived in heaven. He lived behind a thick curtain and or appeared behind a thick curtain in smoke and blinding light. When he spoke, it sounded like thunder and terrified everybody who heard it. But Jesus is just a guy standing in front of them. There's no glow, there's no light, there's no smoke, there's no thunder, there's no angel-driven chariot throne, there's no giant feet on a sapphire floor. It's just Jesus saying, and yet he is saying that if you know me, you know him. If you've seen me, you've seen him. So Philip's still not getting the point. Again, anxiety here. They're, they're, they're sort of ignoring what he is saying. Still, uh, uh, still isn't getting the point. He says, okay, we can believe all this if you just show us the Father. And the fact that we hear this from Philip is uh, interesting because he was an original disciple. He was, you know, day one, Jesus is picking disciples, and, and Philip is one of them. So he's been there from the very beginning. And so Jesus says, if I've been with you so long and you still don't know me, you've seen me walk the earth, you've seen me do things that no earthly person could do, you've heard me preach and teach you all about the kingdom, I've given you everything that the Father has given to me to give you, and you still don't know me. Jesus, of course, isn't saying that he is the Father, but he is saying that he displays the Father. What he does is the Father's work. The Father is in him and he is in the Father. And as they are one God, but the, the Father's works, his energies have been displayed through what Jesus has done. Because Jesus has done everything and only what the Father gave him to do. You've seen the Father because you've seen his works performed through the Son. It's pretty heavy theology that he's sort of dropping on his disciples right here at the end. He's, he's laying a lot on them uh, right here. But the, the point of the theology, though, is not merely to give them more information about God. It is to comfort them. It's to give them strength. It's to encourage them for the road ahead, a road that they're going to have to walk without him physically leading them along. And he's preparing him, preparing them for this moment. As one writer says, their life on earth finds its direction, goal, and power in their belonging to him who is in heaven. From now on, that will mark the secret and the ambivalence of their existence on earth. What Jesus is introducing to them and to us is, as his followers is a new way of understanding the world. The world, of course, is not our ultimate home. Our ultimate home is with Christ in heaven, and yet we do live here. And so the question that arises, what are we to do while we are here? And even more than that, why do we have to stay here? Remember Peter, earlier on, is complaining that he wants to go with Jesus now. <laughs> he wants to go wherever he goes. And we wonder that ourselves, too, sometimes. Wouldn't it be better for us to just directly go to be with God? Sometimes, especially when we're facing trials and difficulties in this life, uh, we think it'd be better to be with Jesus. Why can't I just go straight to heaven? Why do I have to live this earthly life? Why did he leave us here? Are we just running out the clock until we die? Paul had the same question in Philippians. Read in chapter one, he, was, he's, he wonders out loud whether which one is better to live and be with God's people or to die and be with Christ. In fact, he says, my desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. So you're not different than Paul. <laughs> you have the right idea. It is better to be with Christ. Yet Paul also says, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Yes, to die is gain, but to live and have fruitful labor among God's people is Christ. Paul is simply following on the words of Jesus when he said in verse 12, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do. The life on earth of the Christian is important, has significance, 
remaining on this planet for as long as possible is desirable because Jesus has given us work to do. Not work that leads to our salvation, but work that uh, contributes to the salvation of others. Whoever believes in me will do the works that I do and even greater works. Not despite the fact that I am going to the Father, but because I am going to the Father. Now you might ask, what are these works that Jesus is talking about? And, and many people will jump straight to miracles and, and healing and so on. But that's not what Paul is reflecting on in Philippians when he's talking about it. He's talking about the ordinary labor of ministry. And while Paul had that special office of apostle, uh, there's still work for all Christians. Whoever believes, Jesus says, will do these things. And regular believers that aren't apostles don't just do the work Christ did, but even greater works. You might ask, what, how can they be greater than what Christ did? Greater, the term greater here, of course, doesn't mean, I don't think it means better, but it, it, it's rather a difference of quantity, not quality. We'll look next week at the role of the Holy Spirit in all of this, but for now, consider that the word of Christ dwelling in each of us has something to say to our neighbor. The seed that Christ planted by his death and resurrection now grows through us as we carry that message of reconciliation out to the world. We do still have special offices of minister and elder, but those offices exist simply to continue to deliver that word to God's people so that we all might grow in our faith and our understanding, our love for God and each other, so that we all might be witnesses to the love of God for us as we live and work and play in our families and our communities. All of it is part of Christ gathering people to himself. That's what he is up to. That's what he is still doing, not just people from the first century that we read about in John 14, but for all the centuries until he returns. The gospel spreads from Christ to the church and then from the church out to the world. And in this task, we're not alone. Like I said, we'll get to the Holy Spirit, but right here, Jesus says, whatever you ask in my name, I will do it. Now, this is one of those places where people will lift a verse up out of context and think that it means uh, anything you ask, no matter what it is, I'll give it to you. Whatever here does not mean anything in the whole world. Asking for a Ferrari in Jesus' name will not likely lead to the ownership of a Ferrari. I know, because when I was a teenager, I'm pretty sure I did that. What it does mean is that we shouldn't ask for something so ordinary as an Italian sports car. Jesus has much better things to offer. Things we can't put any sort of a price tag on. Because what Jesus offers here is nothing less than life overcoming death. When we ask for his gospel to take root in the souls of people, when we ask for his word to be spread abroad throughout the world, when we ask for more people to come to Christ, when we ask for our own lives to be more and more marked by holiness and righteousness, he will do it. He has done it. He is doing it. He might do it in ways that we don't expect. He might actually, he will do it on his own timetable, not according to our perfect plan. But he will do it. You just have to ask. And so we find that the secret to the Christian life is as simple as prayer. Sometimes we can turn prayer into a burden, into a law we have to fulfill, but that's not what Jesus is doing here. He's offering prayer to us as a gift. He's still listening. He still hear the, hears the prayers of his people. Prayer is not a duty to be performed so that we can check the box of things that we need to do that day. Prayer is a gift to be unwrapped. We have a God unlike all other gods. We have a God we do not need to appease before he will hear us. We have a God we do not need to please before he can hear us. We have a God who's already been pleased and appeased in Christ. And so we ask in Christ's name as his people 
for his will to be done. We ask for him to be glorified in the earth, glorified by new followers and growing followers. This is no burden. This is no waste of time. This is how things get done in the kingdom of God. This is how greater works than Christ did on this earth are accomplished. And so what we find in all of this is that Jesus isn't really saying goodbye. He is, but he isn't. He's leaving, but he will still be present. And his leaving is going to be different than all the other partings that we have in this earth because we can still talk to him. We can still go to him. We can still, there are still things that need to be said. He has left. He has ascended into heaven, but he is still present, just in a different way. His ears are in heaven, but they still hear us on earth. His eyes are in glory, but they still see his people. His arms still attached to his body, and yet they are long enough to reach down to us. He's absent from us, but still somehow present in his people, abiding in us until the day when where he is, we are also. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the great mystery of Christ who says goodbye here on the earth and yet ascends to heaven and we can still have a conversation. We can still bring before you our needs. We can still bring before you the things that hurt us, the things that trouble us, the things where mercy is greatly needed. Father, we thank you that you have not left us alone, that you have not left us without a way to communicate to you, that all we need to do is ask in Jesus' name, and you will be glorified. We pray that we would see this not as a burden, not as something that just has to be done no matter what, but as a great gift that you've given to your people, a people united to yourself, a people that you are as close to as you've ever been, a people that you love as you are our Heavenly Father. We pray we not forget these gifts. We pray in Christ's name.